In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, St. Paul, in his first letter to Corinthians, he differentiated between three types of personality or people. First type, he called them the carnal person. Second type, he called them the natural man. And the third type, he called them the spiritual man. Who is the carnal man? As you know, we have a spirit, body, and soul. So the carnal man is the person who is led by the desires of the flesh. That's why we call him carnal, led by the desires of the flesh. So even if it's against the mind, the human wisdom, for example, drugs, smoking, the the just regular human being will say it, it will destroy your life. It will destroy your health. It will destroy your money. So it's against even the logic. But the carnal man is led by the desires of the flesh. Same thing for sexual immorality. If you think about it, it's going to hurt your body, going to hurt your uh, spirit. It's against the logic for a person to live in sexual immorality. But they cannot control their body. And St. Paul considered these people, he called them babes in Christ, like infants, children. Because the children, they don't have logic. Children, they are led by the desires of the flesh. They want to eat, they want to drink, they want to sleep. So uh, that is how children are. And for example, if they want to play, he, he may choose to play with a knife because he does not have discernment. He cannot say, this is going to hurt me. Uh, and if you take the knife from him, he will start to cry and, and make a big scene. So those who are led by the desires of the flesh, he called them carnal people. And he called them babes in Christ. Babes in Christ. And for these people, you cannot feed them with uh, solid food, like children. Children, you cannot feed them, feed them with solid food. You give them milk because they are not mature. In the same way, the babes in Christ, you cannot feed them with solid spiritual food. You feed them with milk because they cannot accept the solid food. You cannot speak to them about forgiveness. You cannot speak to them about bearing one another's burden. It is above their understanding because they are babes in Christ. That's why you will find among the carnal people conflict, fights, tension, division, because you don't understand the solid food of forgiveness, for example, or bearing with one another. That is the first type. Second type, he called them natural. Natural are those who are led with their mind, with their logic. You may say, but that's good. So the natural man, the problem with the natural man, he cannot understand spiritual things because only you discern the spiritual things by the spirit, not by your mind. So the natural man, he will reject anything against his logic or his mind. He will reject maybe the existence of God. But if he a believer, he may have doubt about Eucharist. And he will tell you how the 
bread and wine change into uh, blood and, and body, body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he made out the perpetual virginity of Saint Mary. Anything that against his logic, uh, he cannot understand it. And many people who became atheists because they judge the Bible and the Word of God and the doctrines and the teaching by their mind, not by their spirit. And you cannot judge spiritual things by your mind, comparing spiritual things by spirit. This brings us to the third person, or third type of persons, the spiritual being. Spiritual people are those who are led by the Spirit of God. And since they are led by the Spirit of God, they understand the things that pertain to God. Although, I'm not going to say they are against our logic, but they are above our mind. There is something against and there is something above. Let me give you an example. If I say a pregnant woman was pregnant for four years and then give birth to a son, that's against the logic. Why should be pregnant for four years? It's against the logic. But when I say uh, St. Mary was conceived without marriage and she gave birth to her son while her virginity is sealed, this is not again the logic. It is above the logic, beyond our understanding. Not against, but beyond our understanding. St. Paul said that servants should be chosen from among the spiritual people, not from among the natural, not among from among the carnal. It will be a big problem if a Sunday school servant is chosen from among the carnal or among the natural. But Sunday school servant, because he is entrusted with teaching, he should be from the spiritual people who actually are called spiritually mature. And as we read in Hebrews chapter 5, he said, since they are spiritually mature, they can discern between good and evil. So in, in Hebrews chapter 5, before we read uh, from First Corinthians, he said, starting from verse, verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you ought to be teachers, like some school uh, teachers. But you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Why? Because they were carnal and natural. They were not spiritual. So what prevented them from becoming Sunday school teachers or teachers? That they are not spiritual. And you have come to need milk and solid food. As I told you, carnal babes in Christ, you feed them with milk. So I cannot ask a child to need a house or to make decision for household. I cannot do this. Uh, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So if I am unskilled in the word of righteousness, how I can teach the word of righteousness in, in Sunday school? For he is a babe. And in Second Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter three, he used the same word, be, need to be fed with milk. But solid food belongs, solid food belongs to those who are of full age, who are spiritually mature. What he meant by full age, that is those who, by reason of use, they, like exercising, training have their senses exercised 
to discern, to discern both good and evil. What is the difference between a little child and a mature person? The child cannot discern between right and wrong. As I told you, he can uh, get a knife and want to play with it. There's a child. There is no discernment. But when we grow, we are able to discern when we grow spiritually. And we know what's right and what's wrong. So if I'm still a carnal man, if I'm still a natural man, then I'm lacking this this discernment. Then I cannot be a teacher. I cannot be a Sunday school servant. As he said in in verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teacher, but you cannot. You need someone to teach you against, against the first principle of the oracles of God. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, St. Paul, you know, Corinth were in, in Greece. And at that time, Greece was very known with what? Philosophy. Yeah, Aristotle, Plato, all these, uh, Socrates, all these great philosophers are from Greece. So St. Paul was troubled. How he will address them, how he will teach them. And he was afraid. So, starting from verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. He decided not to go with the excellence of speech. Because, as, as he explained in chapter 1, the cross was an offense to the Greek. The cross was a stumbling block for the Jews and offense to the Greek. Why? For the Jews, the, they wanted the Messiah to be actually an earthly king and to restore the kingdom of David. So when they saw Jesus crucified and died on the cross and there was no earthly kingdom and he told them, my kingdom is not of this world, they were offended. That's why they did not believe in Jesus Christ. For the Greek, Greek like the natural man, uh, Jews like the carnal man, Jews were looking for earthly kingdom. The Greek, they used their mind. So they considered the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness. How you tell me God dies on the cross? Who was controlling the world and their understanding? You know. So if St. Paul wants to go and preach them with according to their understanding, he should not mention the word of the cross. Because if he mentioned the word of the cross, they will laugh at him. And that's exactly what happened in Arius Bax. When he went and started preaching to the Athenians in Arius Bacchus. Since he said about the resurrection from the dead, people start actually to laugh at him. And they told him, okay, when we'll have time, we'll call you again. And only few people believed. They did not think or accept the idea of resurrection. They considered it foolishness. So when he went to Corinth, he was actually thinking, should I have the, the cross of Christ? Definitely I cannot. Then I cannot go to them with the excellence of speech or the wisdom, human wisdom. Why? As he said in verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you among you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that's what I'm going to preach to you. Either to accept it or not to accept it, but I cannot deny the cross. Christianity is centered around the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you remove the resurrection and crucifixion, it will be just morality. Just a set of morals, value, and, and principles. 
And St. Paul, yeah, as a human being, he was struggling. That's why he, in verse 3 he said, And I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. How people would accept this. How people would accept when tell them God became man, died on the cross, was buried three days. On the third day he rose from the dead. Forty days later he ascended to heaven. How, how this message would be accepted by the Greeks. So, he, that's decision number one. He made some resolutions. And this resolution should be the principles of our ministry, our service. So the first principle, we need to stick to it in verse 4. My speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom. Sometimes when we try to address the atheist or agnostic or people who just defend any, any principle from the world, we try to use the persuasive word of wisdom. But St. Paul said, no. My speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive word of human wisdom. Human wisdom. Like political connectedness. For example, let me give you an example of the human wisdom. Uh, some people say, uh, it's okay to say that I am homosexual, I was created like this, as long as you don't act on it. So they are trying to please the people, it's okay. You can acknowledge that you are homosexual, that's fine. And you can say, I was born like this, that's fine too. But don't act on it, to please the people. But if you think about it, why God created me homosexual? And then he asked me not to act on it. (laughs) Is it fair? Definitely not. But they are using the persuasive ways of human wisdom. Using persuasive ways of human wisdom. But St. Paul said no. By my speech and preaching, in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's the first principle in our preaching. If you are a spiritual man, led by the Spirit of God, then your preaching and your speech will be in the power of the Spirit, in the demonstration of the Spirit, in the power of God. That's why I told you, you cannot be a Sunday school servant unless you are a spiritual person. Because when you speak, the Holy Spirit will be anointing each word you are saying. And each word will go and pierce the hearts of the people. Not because these are your words, but because of the anointment of the Holy Spirit. If you read the Sermon of St. Peter in Acts chapter 2, just read it. It's just a regular, regular sermon. He made some quotes from the Old Testament and explained what happened. So what's unique about this sermon? How this sermon made 3,000 persons to accept Christ, to repent, and to be baptized. It is not the word, it's not the content, but it is the power of the Spirit that accompanied every word. That's why when they heard, they were pierced in their hearts. When you pray before preaching, When you ask God to speak on your mouth, when you ask the Holy Spirit to anoint each word you are saying, then it is not about the persuasive. You will not worry what you are going to say because the Holy Spirit in that hour will teach you what you want to say, what you should say, and will anoint each word. And sometimes very simple words, when you hear it, it, it will transform you. It will change you. Uh, many people, uh, when they go and visit like elderly people, uh, elderly, yani spiritual people, 
when they say just few words, few words has no persuasion or human wisdom. But these words has have transformative effect on our heart. You know why? That's the power of the Spirit, the demonstration of the Spirit. When they hear these words, it will transform them because they were anointed by the uh, Spirit of God. So that's first principle in our ministry. We need actually to ask the Lord that each word we utter should be anointed by the Spirit of God. Second point in verse 6, first point, then we need to speak in the demonstration of the Spirit and power of God. Second point, however, we speak wisdom. So when he said, I'm not speaking with persuasive words and human wisdom, doesn't mean he's not speaking in wisdom. No, he's speaking in wisdom. But which wisdom? However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. This wisdom will understand the spiritually mature people. Yet not of the wisdom, not yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. What is the wisdom of God in a mystery? That is the wisdom of the cross. That is the wisdom of salvation. How God saved the world through the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. That's the mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So this was the economy of God even before the creation of the whole world. Which none of the rulers of this age knew. They will not understand it. It is a natural man who cannot understand the wisdom of God, the mystery of salvation. For had they known, if they know that is the economy of God, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, we say this usually, verse 9, about uh, when we describe the paradise of joy. Which is true yeah, in the litany for the departed, this is description. But St. Paul, when he used this, he was describing the wisdom of God, the mystery of salvation. I had not seen, I has not seen, nor ear heard. So, no eye has seen before God became man, nor ear heard it, nor have entered into the heart of man. Even these things, nobody contemplate on it. Nobody before Christ thought that God will become man and die on the cross and be raised. But this is the economy of God for our salvation. The things which God has prepared for those who love him. God prepared this salvation for those who will accept him, love him, and, and, and follow him. Uh, so, the second point in our preaching, that is the wisdom we need to preach. The mystery of salvation. The mystery of the crucifixion. Many people try to teach Christianity but without the cross. Teach the principle of Christianity. For example, if I speak to you about forgiveness, about humbleness, etc. I can speak about it but without mentioning anything about the cross or about the resurrection. That is, will make the Christian virtue just like any moral principles. But everything actually should start from the cross and resurrection. That is the wisdom that we should be preaching. 
In chapter 3, First Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 18, St. Paul says, Let no one deceive himself. If any among if anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. So let him deny his own logic in order to understand the wisdom of God, which is beyond and above our logic. For the wisdom of this world, verse 19, is foolishness with God. Uh, definitely if I deny uh, the existence of God that's foolishness for God for it is written he catches the wisdom in their own craftiness and again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile so we need actually to deny our wisdom to deny our wisdom in order to learn the heavenly wisdom then that's what we will preach in Sunday school the wisdom of God in a mystery the mystery of salvation and St. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he said uh, in verse in verse 17 for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with the wisdom of with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Because if I want to please the people and use human wisdom, I will hide the cross. People will not accept. What is what is the struggle of most of the non-Christian? Ask any non-Christian. They used to tell you, how you want me to believe that God died on the cross? <laughs> that is their main struggle. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Even those who like to dispute and argue, they will come at the cross and they will be foolish. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? How he made it foolish? Because the wisdom of this world cannot accept the cross. But God, through the cross, he saved the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. When we have the Greek philosophers, they did not know God. They called him the highest power. So in the wisdom of the world, the world could not know God. So it pleased the God through the foolishness of the message of the cross because it is foolish to these wise to, to believe that God became man and died on the cross and rose on the third day. But through what they considered foolishness, God saved the world. For the Jews request a sign. Greeks seek for after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God, what we considered foolishness, is wiser than men. So definitely God has no foolishness. But if, if just for the argument, we consider there is foolishness in God, this foolishness of God is much, much, much wiser than the wisdom of men. And if there is weakness in God, his weakness is much, much, much stronger than uh, men. Then he said, God chosen the foolish thing of the world to put to shame the wise, etc. So the second principle that as Sunday school servant, we need not to rely on the wisdom of the world, 
But on the wisdom of God in a mystery, the mystery of the cross and the mystery of resurrection, all our preaching should be centered around this. Third principle. He said in verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. Again, to understand the spiritual things, it's revelation. It's revelation. As the Lord said to Peter, he, nobody and fle- no flesh and blood revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed who is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So it is revelation to those who are spiritual. Again, that's why we said Sunday school servants should be chosen from among, not the carnal, not the natural, but from the spiritual. For God, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Because the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son, so the Spirit searches all things, understand everything, and reveal this to us. Reveal this to us. The book of Revelation starts with word, which word? Revelation. That what God revealed to John. And God will reveal his mysteries. You're like, the mystery of the Lord is revealed to those who fear him. Sir Allah so the mysteries of God will be revealed to those who fear him who are a spiritual being. And St. Paul explained to us why we need the revelation of the Spirit. So in verse 11, we will, What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Who knows you better than you, than your spirit? No one, we, no one knows you better than your spirit. And the same for... Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. As your Spirit knows you the best, so the Spirit of God knows God the best. And we, verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Each one, when we were baptized and anointed with the Myron, we received the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of God. You are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abides in you. So now, it is actually very, very, very possible that the Spirit of God reveals God to you and the mysteries of God to you through revelation. If you are spiritually mature, if you are not quenching the Spirit, if you are not resisting the Spirit, then the Spirit of God will reveal the mysteries of God. But if I'm grieving the Spirit of God, then there, there is no revelation. We received the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. We'll, un- we'll not have problem to understand the virginal birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have no problem to understand the incarnation. We'll have no problem to understand the mystery of crucifixion. We'll have no problem to understand the mystery of resurrection. We'll not have problem to understand the Eucharist. Because all these things that was given freely to us from God, we understand it not by our mind, but by our by the Spirit of God in us. These things, verse 13, we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You cannot teach the mysteries of God with human wisdom. But you need to teach the mystery of God with the the spiritual words, the spiritual wisdom that you get from the Holy Spirit. Because spiritual things only be compared with spiritual things. You cannot use logic and intellect to prove spiritual things. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
Then he started to speak about the three types of men that I explained in the beginning of the lecture. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot understand them because he relies on his logic, not on the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They cannot accept the existence of God. They cannot accept the incarnation of God. They cannot accept the crucifixion. They cannot accept the resurrection, etc., etc., etc. Because all these things are spiritually discerned. Spiritual discernment means to understand them only by the Spirit of God. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Judge means understand, discern. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. That's why many people consider us who are crazy if we believe in God became man and crucified. They cannot judge us rightly, uh, rightly because they don't understand things pertaining to the Spirit of God. So people consider the Christians, the believers, they are out of their mind. To believe in God who became man and died on the cross, they don't understand this. That's why the spiritual man cannot be rightly judged by anyone. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Can anyone say, I know the mind of the Lord using his own mind? Definitely not. But we have the mind of Christ. And this is the fourth principle. You need to have the mind of Christ as a Sunday school servant. How to acquire the mind of Christ? If you, Christ is the Logos, the Word of God. When you let the Word of God dwell richly in you, you will know the mind of Christ. Many people say, I want to know the will of God in my life. If you have the mind of Christ, then you will be thinking exactly what Christ is, is seeing in this situation. If we have the mind of Christ, we'll make right choices. We'll have discernment between good and evil. But if we don't have the mind of Christ, then we are babes, we are children, infants in Christ, and cannot be Sunday school servants. That's why in, verse, in chapter 3, from verse 1, he told them, And I, brethren, God not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I told you the carnal, led by the desires of the flesh. And that's why they have no discernment. They don't understand the depths of forgiveness, because they try to understand forgiveness away from the cross. They understand how to endure and put with one another away from the cross. They, under, they try to understand the humility and love away from the cross. But see, everything is connected to the cross. God loved the world, so he gave his own begotten son for the life of the world. But he told them, you are carnal, babes in Christ. Verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with so this food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. If St. Paul talked to them about forgiveness, no, there is division among them. And even now, you are still not able. That's why we preach and preach and preach, and people still live their own life, because they are carnal, babes in Christ. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? There was division in, in, um, in Corinth. Some people say you are after Paul. Some people say you are after Apollos. And until now, there are divisions. People say you are children of so-and-so, are children of so-and-so, and these attack those as heretics, and these attack those as heretics, etc. That is, this means who are still carnal, who are still babes in Christ. Uh, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? 
Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. God is appointed us. Some are called to be evangelists, some called to be teachers, some called to be pastors, some called to be apostles, some called to be prophets. As God gave each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And this will be the, the fifth principle. You should know that as a Sunday school servant, you are just a fellow worker with God. God is, is the master builder, and you are working under him. It's not your work, it's not your field. As he said in verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, you are God's building. So, St. Paul said here, don't think of yourself more than who you are. You are just a fellow worker. And if God give you gift to serve in Sunday school, God give another one gift to serve in choir, gift to another one gift to serve in the library, another one gift to serve in the kitchen. Don't think yourself better than the other. All of us who are one, who are completing one another. Don't think that those like them in Sunday school are higher than those who are in the board or those who are in the kitchen or those who clean the church. Different gifts. And we are one. And the master builder is God. And we are just fellow worker with God. According to each talent that each one received. And we need actually to keep this oneness. Because if we are divided against each other, we are babes in Christ. We are not spiritually mature. So, number one, we need to preach relying on the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. Number two, the wisdom of God in in mystery. How to preach the wisdom of God in mystery. Number three, the revelation of God by his Holy Spirit. Number four, to acquire the mind of Christ. Number five, to stay away from divisions. And we know that we are nothing. We are fellow worker with God. God is the master builder. And if we want to add number uh, six, Sunday school servant should be chosen from only the spiritual people, not the carnal, not the natural. Number seven, which is the last point, in verse eight, then we'll go to verse 10. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, each one will receive his reward according to his own labor. So there is a reward and there is a gift. The gift means a free gift. Salvation and going to heaven is a free gift. Inheritance of the kingdom of God is a free gift. But the crowns that we will receive, it's a reward. And each one will receive the reward according to his own labor. That's why we say the martyrs will receive crown of martyrdom. That's a reward. But inheritance of the kingdom of God is a gift, free gift. Verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. What's the foundation? Jesus Christ. Upon this rock, believe in Jesus is the Son of God, and he be- God became man and was crucified, buried, died, rose on the third day. That's the foundation. And let each one and another build on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But we as Sunday school servants, 
Someone, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw. So some people from among us build on this foundation gold with their labor. Others precious stone, others silver, other wood, other hay, and other straw. Then persecution attacked the Christian. Who will survive the persecution? Those who are gold. But the hay and the straw and the wood will be burned. That's why he said, each one's work, your service, will become clear. For the day will declare it. The day of temptation, the day of trouble. For it will be revealed by fire. The trouble or the attack or the persecution will be like fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So here a question to us, what are you building? What are you teaching? Are you building gold? So your children like gold? The fire will purify them more and more? Or they are like hay and straw? The fire will, will burn them, they become atheists and, and homosexuals and they deny the existence of God. If anyone works which he has built on it endures. So if your work endured the temptation of the fire, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. You will not get a reward. But St. Paul gives hope to these servants who built hay or straw or, or wood, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Yani, they will be saved, but they have to struggle very, very, very hard in order to be saved. To struggle, although salvation is a free gift, but to struggle to live the life of repentance, and to enter into the realm of the spirit, to be a spiritual person. So this is the seventh principle. What are you building? Are you building gold or silver or hay or straw? So in these verses, St. Paul actually, and, and then verse 16 and 17, he said, don't you know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So don't give an excuse. I, 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 how can be a spiritual person? No. You are a spiritual person. You have the Spirit of God. But unfortunately, some of us resist the Spirit. Some of, the, of us grieve the Spirit. Some of us quench the Spirit. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So, if I defile the temple of God, mean, means I become carnal, or I continue to be carnal, or I continue to be natural, then God will destroy him. Because the temple of God is holy, which temple you are you. And then the rest of the chapter we discussed before, don't deceive yourself about the wisdom. And then he concluded, verse 21, Therefore, let no one boast in men. The division, because you were boasting in men. I am a, a disciple of Paul. I am a disciple of Apollos. So he said, let no one the boast in men. For all things are yours. God give us everything, whether poor or Apollos or Kephas or the world or life or this or things, present or things to come. All are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. So the seven points that we mentioned today, as principles to us as Sunday school servant, number one, we should be spiritual, not carnal, not uh, natural. Number two, the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. That's how we preach. Number three, the, to reveal the wisdom of God in mystery, the mystery of cross and crucifixion. Number four, this is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. It's revelation. Number five, 
we need to acquire the mind of Christ. Number six, who who plants or who waters are nothing. We are one, complementing one another, as each one received from God. So we need to keep the oneness, and we know we are nothing. God is the one who gives the abundance. And the last point, watch yourself. What are you building? Gold, precious stone, silver, or wood, or straw, or hay. Because the day will actually reveal your work. So I hope these seven points, we uh, think about them and we consider them in our ministry so that uh, in the second coming of Christ, uh, we will receive our rewards uh, based on each one's effort. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.